Hello, well today I'd like to speak to you about Re Olympia and York, which is 1993 square brackets BCLC at page 453 and it's a judgment of Sir Donald Nichols as he then was and it relates to of course the Docklands development and there is a thimble that has Canary Wharf on it so some people will refer to this as the Canary Wharf case Whereas, of course, we'll refer to it as Re Olympia in York or the pig in a poke case. Why? Well, I'll explain. So this is a very important judgment for our conceptualisation of the rescue culture. That culture that's engendered in the 1986 statute and in particular the administration procedure that that statute introduced. Why is it an important case? Well, as you've heard, the citation means that it's a relatively early case, We're talking the early 90s, that helps us test the aims of administration as enacted, as were uh, uh, set out in Section 8 of the Insolvency Act 1986. So this is a really important case because it tests those provisions, but also it's an important case because, of course, it involves a rather large swathe of London town. And in particular, as you'll already perhaps have guessed from what I've said so far, it's the Docklands development that we're talking about, the inception, the genesis of that Docklands development over in East London. So here are the facts of the case, then I'll get to the judgment of Sir Donald Nichols. The facts are basically this. You have the Reichman brothers, who are a set of developers. They're interested in developing the Docklands area of London. Uh, of course, they've already, they're, they're Canadians, they've already developed large swathes of Toronto and New York, these property developers. Then they eye up this area of, of London. And to develop this area would, of course, introduce a competitor region against the city of London that would of course attract perhaps other clients uh, different rent levels uh, in these new buildings that the Reichmans were going to build uh, and all of these facts I should say are set out in an interesting way in a book about the Reichmans which is entitled Too Big to Fail you can perhaps guess why such a title was used so, on with the facts. Well, the Docklands area was developed or began to be developed in terms of buildings. Um, and indeed, the, the Reichmans and the company Olympia and York was able to attract clients, including Ogilvy and Mather, a subsidiary of the WPP advertising group, to some of the buildings, including one which was 10 Kaboot Square. So, Ogilvy and Mather took premises as a tenant in Ten Caboot Square. As time passed, various inducements were paid to other tenants, 70 million for example, to Ogilvy and Mather. The, the project starts to founder for a number of reasons. One, transportation links are not particularly good to Docklands. Two, the City of London gets combative and realises that they need to be proactive in the sense of a response to what was going on with this redevelopment. So the transport links, of course, could be cured. And that's if you could get or persuade the government to invest over a billion pounds to extend the Jubilee Line. All those of you who have visited London will realise that the Jubilee Line does go south of Waterloo and therefore you can guess that it was constructed. That money was pumped into the project to enable that extension over to Docklands from Waterloo. But the other problem, of course, that's to say the competitor City of London activity was a more of an issue for the bottom line of Olympia and York because, of course, if they couldn't offer rents which were attractive, they weren't going to get tenants. And you would get tenants who were currently in place who might complain 
about potential lack of floor space being rented out and what that would mean for landlords in terms of covenants to repair, repair cleaning windows and so on. And so it is that the group founders, this project founders, and crashes into an insolvent position, whereby KPMG and Allen and Overy are appointed. Uh, uh, KPMG, of course, as office holders, and Allen and Overy as advisors to those office holders, to come up with a scheme of reconstruction to reorganise this set of companies. And that's exactly what those professional advisors do when they propose a three-part stage process of reorganisation that basically involves all of our insolvency procedures on the corporate side. Liquidation, schemes, compositions and of course under the umbrella of administration. Hence why we find ourselves in the Chancery Division before Sir Donald Nichols, who has to determine whether or not this administration order should be made. And as we know, we have a protagonist, WPP, one of our tenants in 10 Kaboot Square, who are nervous about whether or not this administration order should be granted because WPP are worried about their position as tenants and whether or not the building, Tenkaboot Square, will be properly maintained. Well, Sir Donald Nichols says that the creditors uh, and the debtors, are, of course, considering what might be viewed as a, quote, pig in a poke. That's to say an old English term for poke, or poke is an old English term for pocket, so if you've got a pig in a poke, there he is sticking out, our little pig, you don't know how big this pig is, do you? Because he's inside a pocket. So only when you get him out that you can see he's quite a big pig, or he's quite small. However, what Donald Nichols Sir Donald said was that, nevertheless, whilst this is a pig in a poke, an unknown quantity in terms of this administration, what it in fact is, is the best chance of facilitating a rescue or reconstruction of this Og of, uh, of this Olympia and York group, and that that, pursuant to the aims of Section 8, a more ben beneficial realisation of assets than on winding up or rescuing the company as a going concern, that this administration order would be made. As part of the reconstruction, the banks, the secured creditors, were required to pump in just over another 250 million. They were already on the hook for over 700 million, hence why the title perhaps of the Reichman's biography is too big to fail. Um, similarly, as I've already mentioned, the government would have to pump in billion, at least a billion to develop the Jubilee Line extension. Uh, and the reason why perhaps WPP and Ogilvy and Maver were nervous was that there was some uh, hundred, uh, sorry, tens of millions in that plan still unaccounted for, but nevertheless still it's this best chance. As to the question of whether or not this is true rescue, we might argue that it isn't a true rescue case, although it exemplifies the use of the procedures, of course, but it doesn't represent rescue, when of course what you have is the injection of one over a billion by the government, and another 250 million by the bank syndicates who are owned, owed over 700 million. So does this injection of, of nearly 1.5 billion as new monies mean that we're rescuing this enterprise? Or is it more that in fact we're undertaking a, a reconstruction that isn't necessarily rescue? It's a debatable point and one which we'll argue in tutorials. Nevertheless, now when we look over and see the slightly larger buildings over in Docklands, such as Canary Wharf, when we're looking at the Docklands development and places like One Canada Square, there it is, or Tengaboot Square, we should think that it does. The, the structure and the development stand as some form of testament to the rescue culture that which is 
emboldened and created by the Insolvency Act 1986 and Section 8 as enacted in regards to administration. So that's Olympia and York and Sir Donald Nichols' judgment in a nutshell. Do read the case, it's relatively brief, and the Reichman's biography if you get a chance. It's very interesting. Until the next case, then I bid you goodbye. So it's goodbye from me.